the release of Encanto, there's now 60 films in the Disney animation canon. So today I'm gonna stop and rank all 60 Disney animation films from the worst to the best. Hi, my name is Sean and I started this channel because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place to consider clicking that subscribe button. With that said, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. What do you think are the worst Disney animation films of all time? My list isn't the right list, it's just my list and I would love to see yours. With that said, let's get started. In last place, Saludos Amigos. In the 1940s, Disney animation ran into some financial trouble due to an animator strike as well as World War II, in which case, instead of producing feature-length stories, they put together six of these kind of collection movies where they took multiple shorts, crammed them together, and called it a movie. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. From my perspective, these aren't really movies, but they are part of the Disney canon, thus I must include them in this list. And this one basically has this theme about traveling and tourism to Latin America. So you have Donald Duck heading down to Latin America and having a series of shorts where he learns about the culture, intercut with documentary footage about the area that he's going to. The shorts are forgettable. The runtime is only about 45 minutes long. There's just nothing here that stands out to me except for the fact of how weird it is that this is in the Disney canon. Number 59, Make Mine Music, a disjointed collection of shorts with no clear theme running throughout them. It's just a person or an item dancing to music with no clear story. And then in the middle of it, you get Casey at Bat, which just feels totally out of place with all of the other shorts included here. And in fact, of all the Disney animation films, this seems to be the one that Disney is most embarrassed of. It is the only film in the canon that is not on Disney Plus. No way. In order to watch it for this video, I had to buy a 20 year old DVD of it and every version that they release these days has been censored. They cut a couple of segments out because they find them offensive. So. Disney doesn't even want you to watch this movie, so that tells you how good it is. The only reason it's not in last place is that it does have this Peter and the Wolf segment that that's a classic story with some pretty classic music, therefore it stands out just a little bit and makes squeaks at one spot above last place. 58, Melody Time, another wartime era collection of forgettable shorts. This one with kind of a theme about the open range being out in the wilderness, whether in the snow, in a desert, but not much here that really stands out. And the things that did stand out weren't for good reasons. A lot of the animation just doesn't really feel like Disney animation. Then there's this live action segment in the middle with people camping. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious to see in the middle of a Disney animation film and for all the wrong reasons, so just another forgettable collection of shorts. Next up, Three Caballeros, a slightly wittier and more clever wartime collection of shorts. This one just had a bit more wordplay in it that stood out a little bit. One of the plots has Donald Duck going into a book and dancing with the different people. So just a few things that had a little bit of creativity to them. Then again, there is this one short in the middle about a flying donkey that just felt a little bit like Dumbo 2.0. So nothing great here, just slightly more memorable and creative than the bottom picks. Coming in at 56, fun and fancy free, another collection of shorts from the wartime era, but this time it mainly focused in on these two stories, in which case they're more fleshed out. There's an actual story being told. Jiminy Cricket as our host for the presentation telling us these stories. So it just feels a little bit more thought out and packaged a little bit better. The first one on here about Bongo, has once again some of those Dumbo, Dumbo 2.0 vibes. The thing that really makes it stand out is the Jack and the Beanstalk bit that is actually a little story that I remember from my childhood just a little bit. It's not great, but at least it stands out as an interesting little version of Jack and the Beanstalk. But in general, 
not really a film, not really all that great. And even at points in time, it feels more like someone reading you a book than them telling you the story. So while it's better than most of the other wartime Arab collections, still far from even good. And then we have Chicken Little, a story about a chicken who doesn't fit in and thinks he might find his place in this world by joining the baseball team. And then it turns into an alien invasion story. Wow, that was weird. Everything about this movie feels like the low-hanging fruit that lesser studios crank out, not something that Disney would produce in the 21st century in the decade after the Renaissance. Kind of everything about it kind of felt off to me. Even the logo at the beginning didn't look right. And then tonally, it overly relies on pop music and pop culture references. They even like sing Spice Girls wannabe at one point in time. And so it's just a movie that it feels odd to me that Disney made this film. It tries to kind of pull it all together in the third act, but to me, it was just a mess that's beneath Disney, especially in the 21st century. And number 54, Brother Bear. If Chicken Little was overly childish and kiddie, they followed it up with the overly serious brother bear. At least it's overly serious for the first 25 minutes, which have plot points about a dead mother as well as a dead brother. And then all of a sudden characters turn into bears and it turns into kind of the screwball goofy comedy at times where nothing really pops except when the strange brew guys come up. Good day, I'm Bob McKenzie, this is my brother Doug. How's it going, eh? Welcome to our movie, eh? You wouldn't like us, eh? We're really gaming. Yeah, eat Hooper brains over there. Oh, nice, eh? That's mighty decent of you, eh? Yeah. Which in and of itself is a little bit weird because Rick Moranis retired from acting and of all the projects for him to return and come out of retirement for, why on earth did he pick this project? To me, it's just a very tonally uneven film that can't decide if it wants to be serious or if it wants to be corny and goofy, and it doesn't balance the two at all. And even when it comes to the animation, it looks very dull, and in fact, looks kind of like a direct-to-video Disney animation sequel rather than one of their theatrical releases, and so this one to me just did not work. That'll bring us to Fantasia 2000. Now, I'm someone that has never particularly enjoyed the original Fantasia, so a second Fantasia isn't of much interest to me. Now, I could totally respect the talent on display. A bunch of the animation is absolutely gorgeous. There's a lot of nice artistic visualizations. And so if that's your sort of thing, I can see why you might enjoy either one of the Fantasias. I, however, do not enjoy this sort of thing and much prefer a story-focused film. The other thing that's just weird about this one is that they decided to bring in all of these celebrities to introduce a bunch of the segments, and they are just absolutely cringe-inducing. I have just been informed, plays the violin. Well, so do I, big deal. Could I have my violin, please? Ah, thank you. All right, boys, let's, ho. Oh, oh, sorry. And especially because of the nature of Fantasia, that's supposed to be a little bit more kind of prestige. It's inherently more artistic by trying to visually represent the music that's being played. And when you have these comedians coming in and doing very cheesy jokes, it just diminishes the effect entirely. And then there's a segment where they put Donald Duck in the Noah's Ark. Why, 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 why would they do this? <laughs> Which is, that is just a weird combination that I don't think was the best idea. Number 52, The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, the final film from the wartime era, and it is two shorts combined into one. The first one being about Ichabod and the Sleepy Hollow story about the Headless Horseman. That is the more memorable of the two sequences because the Headless Horseman story is, of course, iconic. Of course, most of the story here about the rival love interest, the love triangle, all that stuff, isn't nearly as interesting or memorable as the final two minutes when the Headless Horseman actually shows up and you have that chase and you have the flaming pumpkin skull being thrown, all that stuff. Iconic. The rest of it, 
you kind of forget how long it takes to get to that point in time. The other story, Mr. Toad, isn't quite as interesting, but at least it does tell a full story where there are characters, plot points, and things that happen. So for me, this was easily the best of the wartime era Slightly memorable, but once again, not really all that good. Next up, the Aristocats. I have no clue how controversial this placement actually is, but this is one of these films that I always think that I'm going to like it more than I actually do. And re-watching it, it simply made no impact on me. It just felt like kind of a mix of Lady and the Tramp with 101 Dalmatians, except minus all the iconic characters and songs. And almost every Disney animation film at least has something that just stands out as that unique sequence, that great song, that melody that gets stuck in your head. And there's just simply nothing like that with this film for me, in which case it's just a film that I'm aware that it exists. I've seen it many times throughout the decades, but it just leaves no mark on me. I don't have specific even criticisms of it. It's just a movie that just does not leave any mark whatsoever. Kicking off our top 50, Home on the Range, a movie that's memorable only for being the cow film, but it's unassuming, it's harmless, it's just trying to be a good time, and it's kind of a fun time. And after watching the overly serious Brother Bear right before this movie, I kind of appreciated that it's a film trying really hard to at least put some sort of grin on my face. Now, certainly, it's a very kiddie film, Except the point in time where it makes the breast implant jokes about whether udders are real or not. Why? But like most of the films from the post-Renaissance, I'm just very confused as to after they made so many great films during the 90s, I don't understand why they made so many of these just low-brow, forgettable, low-hanging fruit kitty films like Home on the Range during the Zeros. Number 49, Fantasia. As I said before with Fantasia 2000, this is simply not my thing. Even in the introduction of the film, they make it clear that a lot of the segments aren't narrative-based film. They're just visualizations of art, trying to show off what you can do with animation when combined with great music. And I can appreciate the talent on display. A lot of the things they do are very cool, but would I ever choose to just sit down and watch Fantasia on my own? No, outside of The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which of course is an iconic classic little segment for Mickey, outside of that one, this just isn't something that I would choose to watch on my own. So I can't put it higher up on the list, even though it accomplishes what, what it's going for rather well. I just do not care about the thing that it's going for whatsoever. Then we have Oliver and Company. To the best of my knowledge, this might be the first film that I saw in theaters. At least it's the first one that I have vague memories of seeing it in theaters. As for the movie itself, it's kind of a by the numbers cat and dog version of Oliver Twist that's cute enough while not being particularly memorable. It's also a movie that doesn't feel all that much like a Disney film. Even the New York City setting with Coca-Cola ads in the background feels like something a different studio would put out and lacks that Disney identity. Likewise, it's a movie that's just jam-packed with songs, but they're actual pop songs, not Disney songs, as you kind of expect from Disney films. And so just a lot of things were just, didn't feel like a movie that Disney would put out. It's also a movie that came out right before The Little Mermaid, which of course kicked off the Disney Renaissance and has become this classic film that people have been watching for 30 years. And it came out the same day as The Land Before Time, which sparked roughly one million direct-to-video sequels. And it just feels like this movie just kind of got lost in all of it as the end of an era that wasn't the best for Disney animation. And for me, not one of the more memorable 
films that they've put out. Number 47, The Black Cauldron. Now growing up, I actually read the books that The Black Cauldron was based off of, but I'd never seen the film, which was kind of interesting to me because I only read like two books when I was growing up. They made a movie out of one of them and I was never able to watch it. I was curious, like, how did that happen that I never watched The Black Cauldron? Well, it turns out the movie was such a box office failure that Disney didn't release it on home video until 1998 and that will do it. So I finally watched it for the very first time in preparation for this video, and the animation was much more impressive than I was expecting. Like, the budget for the film is certainly on display with what they did with the animation, but when it comes to the actual story, it feels like the greatest hits of fantasy tropes with the magic sword, the princess in distress, the big sacrifice at the end. It's all the stuff that you're supposed to have in a fantasy story but without the runtime to be able to properly set up those moments or develop them, in which case it has all the stuff you're supposed to have, but all of it just rings hollow, unfortunately. And that's why it's difficult to tell a story of this scope and size in only 90 minutes. Likewise, it is awfully dark for a movie for kids. There's, there's skeletons and demons and dragons putting children and animals in peril from beginning to end. And so while I did read the books, I do like the genre. I don't think they were able to fully pull it off here. That'll bring us to the sword in the stone. Now the King Arthur legend feels like prime material for a great Disney animation film. But unfortunately here, it feels like they picked the least interesting direction to go with the King Arthur character. Did you ever want to see King Arthur turned into a fish, a squirrel, and a bird for the sake of education? Yeah, me neither, but we do have a movie where that takes place. In fact, this plays out a little bit more like Cinderella for boys, except it's not even as interesting as that sounds. So while the characters are kind of fun, the source material itself is interesting, the direction they take it, not so much. And even the, the part where he pulls the sword out of the stone feels a little bit tacked on at the end. And so this is one that I wanted to like a lot more than I actually liked it. Number 45, Dinosaur. An interesting visual experiment combining CGI dinosaurs with live action scenery in the background that in and of itself makes it a unique film, but at the same time, there's a reason that that technique didn't continue on afterwards because it can be a little bit distracting. This is also an interesting experiment in that it doesn't use Disney's usual bag of tricks. It's not a musical. It's not really designed to be a big overt comedy, in which case it's a film for children that's awfully serious at the same time. There are things about the story that are compelling and interesting, but it's kind of a weird mix when you're trying to aim a story for such a young age group while it's about anthropomorphized dinosaurs fleeing an extinction event. Not a great plan. It's awfully heavy for a movie designed for children. Now, the big standout here was the James Newton Howard score that like all of his scores, is pretty phenomenal. But when you have these dinosaurs fleeing for their life and having moments of victory and his score comes in, it's tough to not feel a lot of big emotions. Next up, The Rescuers, a fun enough concept about a pair of rescuers trying to save a child. Our odd couple in the mix have nice chemistry between the two of them. The story has a clear conflict, clear villains. We know what we're aiming for, so there's constant story forward momentum. But at the same time, the environment that they chose just feels awfully drab, and I think it sucks the fun out of what should be a pretty safe, easy adventure to have fun with, but because of the context where it's taking place and how dark it can get at times, it just kind of diminishes the effects all throughout the entire film. So it's one of these movies that I always think I'm going to enjoy it more than I actually do. The setup is there, the characters are there, but in the execution, it just loses a little something. Number 43, Ralph Breaks the Internet. Now, it is so disappointing to me that this movie is on this list because I loved the original Wreck-It Ralph. I was so excited to check this movie out and 
I actually really enjoyed the first half of this movie. The basic setup about Vanellope breaking the video game and they're trying to fix it so they go onto the internet, all the pop culture references, the 21st century technology and video games, all that stuff, I had a lot of fun with it. Now, certainly a bunch of the internet references were dated right out of the gate and a little bit cringe inducing, but there was still a good bit of fun to be had. And unfortunately though, once the initial plot starts to get resolved about 60, 70% of the way through the movie, they introduce this whole other threat and villain so that they can have this big gigantic showdown in the third act. And I actively dislike the entire last third of this movie. You've made a huge mistake. Feels like a solid sequel with a really bad third movie tacked on at the end. And it sours me on this entire film. And to be entirely clear, I have three kids under the age of 10 and all three of them have gone through extensive Wreck-It Ralph phases. So I've seen both Wreck-It Ralph movies Many, many, many times, and I have a bunch of adorable footage of my youngest going, row, 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 row. <laughs> Who is it? <laughs> That's right. When she wanted to watch Wreck-It Ralph, and every time I watch the first half of this movie, I'm like, hey, this isn't so bad. And every time I watch the final third, I'm like, oh yeah, I hate all of this. So unfortunately, this movie has to be in my bottom 20. Number 42, Bambi. Now I imagine it's probably a flaming hot take to have Bambi in the 20 worst Disney animated films of all time, but this is one that I just don't enjoy all that much. Sure, the animals are cute. There's several of these shots of Bambi tripping and falling over that are of course iconic and memorable. Thumper, a fun character with a name that lines up with his behavior really nicely so it sticks in your brain. But when it comes to the actual story, it's intentionally just kind of this cycle of life. Life, birth, death, giving birth to your own children. And so there's just not to me anything all that compelling. It's sort of like if you did The Lion King but removed all of the forward story momentum and compelling stuff. And so you just have the circle of life, in which case the big thing that people remember about Bambi is cute animals and Bambi's mom dies, traumatizing kids for nearly 80 years now. So for me, I rewatched it last night. It was one of the last movies I watched in preparation for this video and I just don't dig it all that much. Well, of course I realize that it is a very important film in the history of cinema. Finishing up the bottom 20, Treasure Planet. Now this is a movie that I always think that I'm going to enjoy more than I actually do because the basic concept of taking Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island and doing this sci-fi steampunk version of it as a Disney animation film, that sounds like it'll be right up my alley. Likewise, I love the animation style that's this combination of 2D animation with these 3D animation backgrounds, but in the actual execution, it doesn't come together for me. I just don't care enough about the characters. There's some things that just feel like misfires where there's a creature that speaks in farts and the language is called flatulence get the joke, stuff like that that just doesn't really interest me all that much. But I think at the core, a big part of the problem is that you're trying to tell this big epic story that would make for a really good PG-13, two and a half hour long movie, but they're squishing it into the PG rating in a 95 minute runtime, in which case a bunch of stuff gets underdeveloped. We're rushing through plot points, rushing through world building to just get to the end of the film and that squeezes all out all the life out of it for me, which is frustrating because I really think there's a version of this film that I would be very into given the basic concept and the studio involved, but for whatever reason, it just doesn't come together for me. Kicking off our top 40 is Dumbo. This is another one of these golden age classics that's filled with iconic imagery, a memorable lead character, 
but it's also a film that I don't particularly enjoy all that much. Now, of course, Dumbo is absolutely adorable. Him starting to fly at the end is one of those just classic, classic Disney images. But as a film itself, I just find it to be too mean-spirited for too much of the runtime, where adults are targeting anger and gossip and malice towards a child and being totally unreasonable. So it just makes for a frustrating watch. It's also a movie that feels a bit like they ran out of time or budget, so they couldn't complete a full third act. And so the movie's famous for Dumbo flying. That happens at 57 minutes into the movie, which would be fine if it was a normal length movie, but it's only an hour and three minutes long. And so the thing the movie's most famous for happens literally in the last 10 minutes as if they couldn't complete the narrative they wanted to do. So for me, this one really underwhelms on rewatch. Next up, The Emperor's New Groove. Now this is a movie that a lot of people, including my wife, absolutely love and find hilarious. And it does have a number of redeeming qualities. David Spade is in top form with all of his sarcasm. The big standout for me here is Gronk. Here I am. Excuse me, I meant Kronk. Those are two totally different people. And there really are a lot of quotable, memeable moments inside of this film. But the thing that just ruins this film for me is that the lead character is just so unlikable and unpleasant. I understand the whole point of the movie is that he's selfish at the beginning and he learns compassion by the end. But that doesn't work if your lead character is worse and more tyrannical than the film's villain. In which case, she's a hero for removing a narcissistic tyrant that is torturing people, abusing people, and kicking them out of their homes. She's not in the wrong for removing him, so we shouldn't want her to be defeated, and it just undermines the entire story, and it hurts this whole film for me. Number 38, The Princess and the Frog. This time, Disney takes their princess idea to New Orleans, puts a new twist on the classic frog princess story. A lot of the animation is absolutely gorgeous. There's a number of creative ways that they visualize several of the songs, and all throughout the story, it subverts expectations in the good way, where it sets up the cliche and then does something clever and different at the moment where you have the usual payoff. Then in some ways, it's a prototype for what they did with Frozen just a few years later. But the story's swamp setting is just filled with so much base level humor, spit, mucus, toothless flies. There's even a shot of someone shoveling poo. Ew. And the voodoo villain is kind of so dark and creepy that it just creates an environment and a context that I don't really enjoy spending time in. Now, my wife enjoys a whole bunch of the songs. I didn't find them all that memorable, but it's not a genre that I'm interested in quite as much. And so while I enjoy what they did with the story, I don't really like the execution of the rest of it. Coming in at number 37 is Lady and the Tramp, and this is another one of these older Disney animation films that everyone has seen. I don't think it makes any significant mistakes in the execution. It's just a film that at its core I find to be kind of dull, and like many of these older Disney films, mean-spirited at its core. It's about a dog that's forgotten, and then there's this maid that's intentionally cruel towards the dog. And so there's all these little moments that don't always sit quite right with me when it's targeted towards a sweet little cute little dog. And beyond that, beyond one iconic scene with two dogs kissing while eating spaghetti and a couple of nice old timey type songs, there's just not much that's all that memorable or interesting to me in this film. So it's just kind of there. That'll bring us to Pocahontas. After the success of The Lion King, Disney wisely decided to go in a different direction by tackling a historic event. Once again, the soundtrack is filled with memorable, catchy tunes, and there's a number of big, epic, sweeping sequences. But it's a movie that just kind of feels devoid of fun, and it doesn't put something equally as captivating in its place. 
As a lead character, Pocahontas is awfully serious and she frequently kind of drifts into lecture mode. And there are a couple of quirky sidekicks to add some levity into the mix, but they don't seem to be as prominent in the story as they are in other Disney tales. And so you just have this movie that is trying to be big, epic, and sweeping, but it fails to entertain. Likewise, it can come off a little bit forgettable because it uses a story template that was used many times before this movie came out and it's been copied many times since it came out. Me, baby, one more time. In the end, while there is some gorgeous animation and some solid songs, there's just not much that draws me to re-watch this film. Number 35, Pinocchio. For me, this is easily the most complete story of the golden age with a very clear story, character arc, messaging and themes. It's jam packed with iconic and memorable moments, catchy little songs and things that have just kind of saturated the popular culture for 80 years now. I'm a real boy. <laughs> but it's also a movie that feels very much like a product of its time and the way that it functions as kind of like a morality tale for children that's also a horror story where this naive newborn child essentially is brought up, sent off into this world unsupervised and then is constantly chastised because adults take advantage of the fact that he's naive and gullible, in which case it's a child being exploited throughout the entire movie, a child being enslaved, punished, lectured. So all that just sits very wrong with me of like how Pinocchio is treated in this film. So it is a classic, it is gorgeously animated, I don't know that I enjoy it though. Coming in at number 34 is The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Now I can appreciate Disney wanting to experiment and try new things by telling a, a darker and more somber story. You have to try new things, otherwise you get stale. And that's what they did with this film. And I know for a lot of people, this is one of their personal favorites because it is more mature and thematically rich. For me, while I can appreciate the experiment, I'm just not sure that every story fits into the Disney formula, especially with a film like this that has plot points involving public humiliation, infant side, political and religious corruption, sin, damnation. It's just awfully heavy stuff for a movie that also has two wacky, goofy, gargoyle sidekicks. So for me, the, the mix of ingredients doesn't make for a fulfilling experience. Now, the animation is gorgeous. It is filled with these big, gigantic, sweeping shots. There are some powerful songs in it. It's just not a movie that I enjoy on rewatch. 33, The Fox and the Hound, an old fashioned style Disney film. Feels like it could have come out during the gold or silver ages. It's a simple story about a fox and a hound who form a friendship, but because they are a fox and the hound, lots of conflicts ensue as they get older. It's unassuming. It doesn't demand a lot of the audience. And as you move into the final 15 minutes or so, it does have some nice little beats along the way. And the whole movie has plenty of cute little animals. It's not the most memorable of Disney films, but it's also not one that does a lot of things that frustrate me either. It doesn't have particularly high highs, doesn't have particularly low lows. It's just kind of right there in the middle. And I think maybe it might have paid off a little bit better if they'd spent more time building that friendship at the beginning because it felt like they had 10 minutes of bonding and then they go in their separate ways. And so it doesn't pay off quite as well as I think as it could have if we'd really spent more time with them forming that friendship. But an okay film. Next up, Hercules. And to me, this is one of the biggest missed opportunities of the entire Disney canon because Hercules seems like such ripe source material for a great Disney animation film. And this one's good enough. The big problem here is that it introduces so many different plot lines, so many different tones, that there's enough stuff here for like five different movies. And so instead of one great Hercules movie that picked one of these ideas and ran with it and really developed it, it just throws everything in, blends it all together, and it just feels like it's all 
over the place. And because the source material is so strong, because this was during kind of a creative prime for Disney, there's no shortage of entertainment value. It's just so unfocused. You stay focused. And so a movie that had so much potential, it's not a disaster, it's just all over the place. 31, Winnie the Pooh, and as a point of clarity, this is the Winnie the Pooh that came out about 10 years ago. The film is light and unassuming. It continues in the style of the classic Winnie the Pooh stories in that it very much feels like a book coming to life. It's filled with all the wordplay and wit that you expect from a Winnie the Pooh story in an era where every movie's trying to go bigger and louder and more energetic. This movie was a callback to an earlier time period that relied more on simple wittiness rather than big spectacle. Now, the reason this one's a little bit lower on the list is because it's one of the least ambitious films of the Disney canon. It has plenty of entertainment value, but it's little over an hour in length. It's intentionally episodic in nature. So it does a very good job at doing what it set out to do, but it aimed lower than most of the films on this list. Bringing us into the top 30, The Rescuers Down Under. In a lot of ways, this feels like the black sheep of the Disney Renaissance. It's the sequel to a Bronze Era film, and it came out sandwiched between The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, where clearly the animation studio was heading in a new direction, trying to have a little bit more prestige with these big, sweeping classic tales filled with memorable, catchy songs, and between the two of them, you get this old school style adventure. But for what it's worth, I think this is a big improvement over the first Rescuers. The simple advances in animation technology make this film look much better and more modern than the original Rescuers. I think the Outback is a more pleasant environment to tell a story like this as opposed to the swamp of the original film. So it has all the positive sides of the original Rescuers in particular. The two lead characters are still adorable. There's a great voice cast and it's just a nice simple adventure but improves on all of the little details that kind of go around with it. It might not be the most memorable film of the Disney canon, but it is a nice little adventure. 29, The Great Mouse Detective. Right out of the gate, this is a movie that has an accessible and fun central concept as essentially it's Sherlock Holmes for kids. The story is cinematic in that it has a big scale to it while being about small, tiny creatures. There's a clear conflict and villain. We know what we want to achieve by the end of the story. And the movie features probably the best mouse burlesque show I've ever seen. But why? With that said, for a movie with a simple concept and clear conflict, it does take a while before Basil starts investigating. There are quite a few sequences where characters are telling other characters information that the audience already knows. And so while it is easy to watch, it's a fun little adventure. It's not one that makes a big impact either. 28, Robin Hood. The fun source material easily sets up some nice little adventures with a bunch of lively characters. And that's not terribly surprising since they're taking classic literature that has stood the test of time with characters that have just become part of Western culture and Disneyifying them, turning them into singing and dancing animals. It's immediately charming and endearing. Now from there, the storytelling's rather episodic, especially during the first half, which is just a series of mini adventures that don't necessarily lead one into the other, but it gets a bit more focused in the second half. Prince John, I think at times, maybe was a bit too prominent. I wish we got to spend more time with Robin Hood, but at the end of the day, it's not trying to tell a big gigantic story. It's just trying to have a bunch of fun with these characters that we enjoy spending time with, and it su succeeds well enough at doing that. Then we have Meet the Robinsons, a fun, lighthearted, heartwarming time travel adventure. It plays a little bit like reverse <laughs> Back to the Future with what the basic premise of the story is. I'm normally a sucker for time travel stories, and that is the case here. It also has like a clear message about keep moving forward. At the same time, I think in the actual execution of some of the specifics, 
it doesn't live up to its central concept. Bolo Hat Guy is a villain, is very awkward, weird, insecure, and stupid. So he just doesn't pose much of a threat. The animation looks incredibly dated. It was early CGI, and I just don't think what they did with this one has stood the test of time very well at all. And it just doesn't really feel like a Disney animation film. Granted, my concept of a Disney animation film is very narrow, and it involves princesses and talking animals. So maybe that's my fault. But, you know, it's a fun adventure with a nice heart. Just some problems in the execution. Coming in at number 26, The Little Mermaid. This film kicked off the Disney renaissance by adapting Hans Christian Andersen's classic tale. This was a return to a certain style of storytelling that just had a bit more weight to it. It's jam-packed with catchy, memorable songs and likable and charming characters. And the lead character is immediately relatable and endearing because of her enthusiastic curiosity and desire to simply be a part of our world. Now, where this one kind of loses me a little bit is that I feel like the story and the storytelling aren't nearly as powerful as the characters and the songs. You know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Every time I watch this movie, I expect to be swept up in the narrative more than I actually am. And so it's a movie that has some really high highs, but the central through line of it, I don't find all that captivating. And so while I love this era of Disney films, this isn't one of my favorites of the bunch. 25, Lilo and Stitch, possibly the weirdest Disney animation film of all time. It's one part E.T., one part Men in Black, one part alien monster bounty hunter movie, one part family drama, and all told by someone that seemed to like Elvis a little bit too much. No way. For me, this one worked best when it was this alternate version of E.T. about the two sisters and then the relationship between Lilo and Stitch. That stuff worked better for me than all the alien invasion bounty hunter plot points in the movie. But overall, a movie that has a lot of odd things about it, but that's kind of what makes it endearing in a quirky way. Then we have Moana. Disney's take on the Polynesian mythology is led by a great central character. She's strong-willed, she's determined, she knows what she wants, and I love that they don't feel the need to squeeze in a romance. She's strong enough on her own. As you'd expect, the music, the songs are all fantastic. Where I'll Go is a standout. And I think Hey Hey steals every single scene that he is in. Now, the reason this one isn't higher up on the list is that the specific story isn't one that I've particularly resonated with. It also feels a bit like they're trying to squeeze a bit too much mythology into the Disney formula. And... At times, Maui could be a bit frustrating <laughs> in how difficult and pompous that he can be. But we're at the point in time in this list where there's over 25 really good Disney films, so it's making this list something's going to be lower than you want it to be. Also, if you're someone that loves Moana, everyone else in my household agrees with you. All of my kids have gone through Moana phases, and my wife really digs this film too. 23, Bolt. Now, this is a movie I didn't see it when it first came out, but all three of my kids have gone through a Bolt phase where they watch this movie on repeat, so I've seen it many, many, many times. And of all the movies they could pick to watch on loop, I don't mind that this is one of the movies that they picked. At its core, it's a cute story about animals on a road trip with a bunch of fun, exciting action sequences. The central premise about a character that thinks that they're a superhero is pretty reminiscent of Toy Story. You are a toy! Is that real? Does this look real to you? Or that? Is that real? Or that? But it's a formula that works well enough, it's enjoyable enough, and it pays off pretty nicely as you move into the third act of the film. And so, it's not swinging for the fences, 
but it's definitely delivering plenty of entertainment. Next up, The Jungle Book. And this is a bit of a tricky one for me because it is just jam packed with likable characters, catchy songs that have been stuck in my head since I was a child and memorable sequences. But it's also tied together by the thinnest of plot lines. It plays a lot more like a series of shorts that have been cut together rather than actually a single compelling narrative arc for a film. But as for each of these little shorts, they're a ton of fun. The villain here, Shere Khan, of course, is iconic and memorable. Every child would love to have a mentor like Blue the Bear. And so on the one hand, it's got all this great stuff but on a story level, I mean, Shere Khan isn't even a threat until the very end. You could change the order of most of these stories. It wouldn't change anything whatsoever because it's not building momentum towards anything. And so I can't put it like in the top tier, even though a bunch of the characters and memorable songs are top tier for me. Closing out our mid tier is the latest Disney animation film, Encanto. And this is another Disney animation film just filled with these characters that pop, that you want to spend more time with. The animation is simply gorgeous and so vibrant and colorful. And then it creates this mythology surrounding this house that's just filled with intriguing little details. It made this story feel a little bit like the early Harry Potter books and films to me, where you have this girl with this mystery where she's investigating the home with all these corridors that take you off to these exotic locations. So the movie creates this world that you want to explore with a set of characters that you like spending time with. But I also felt like the story that they chose to tell was awfully small for the scope and size of the mythology that they built out. Like they create a house filled with superheroes and then create a plot line that's only about saving the house and the superhero powers. And it just felt like there was something bigger or more that they could have done with this set of characters in this mythology. And so I had a blast with it. I enjoyed all of it, but I felt like there was even more that they could have done with the story to take it up to that next level. Kicking off our top 20, the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh. A simple, breezy children's tale from a very different era that instead of valuing spectacle and size, was all about telling a clever and witty story. It's also very meta, 40 years before Deadpool made it cool to be meta. It has all these clever ways in which it plays into the fact that it's an adaptation of a book and it structures its narrative and its storytelling all around the fact that we are bringing a book to life and it just makes for a very unique cinematic experience while being very small in size in another way. All of the dialogue is just filled with wit and cleverness, playfulness. So it's not a gigantic story, but it is a very enjoyable one. Number 19, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Now this is a bit of a tricky one to rank because this is the original feature length animated movie. It was absolutely groundbreaking. It's a classic and it laid the foundation that every animated movie over the last 80 years has built on top of and built upon its legacy. It's jam packed with a whole bunch of songs and images that have just become part of the popular culture. Each of our dwarves have uh, are memorable, iconic so much so that it's one of those questions, can you name all seven of the dwarves for a movie that came out over 80 years ago. At the same time, it's compared to modern day, the storytelling is simplistic and episodic in certain sort of ways and clunky in the way that it kind of closes things out. And so while absolutely this is one of the most important, or not possibly the most important animated film of all time, certainly over the last 80 years, a number of movies have come along that have been more entertaining or easier to watch. So while this is probably the most important film on this list, I can't put it all the way up at the top. Next up, Alice in Wonderland, a gleefully episodic and dreamlike adventure. It absolutely captures the wit and the wordplay of the Lewis Carroll source material, and it is just jam-packed 
with these iconic sequences and characters that everybody recognized. And so many of the sequences, even though I hadn't seen this movie in years, I was realized I had the whole thing memorized from having seen it so many times before and because it's written in such a catchy fashion. Likewise, it hops around with this energetic, witty vibe to it that it captures so much of the 21st century ADHD storytelling that a lot of the movies of the last decade have had. At the same time, it doesn't necessarily have the best forward narrative momentum to kind of propel it higher up to the top levels of this list, but certainly one of these movies that everybody needs to see, and once you've seen it, you remember it. Number 17, Zootopia. Now this is a movie that when I first saw the trailer, I thought, eh, this one might end up being a bit of a dud, but still, I took my kids to go see it. In fact, this was the very first movie my kids saw in the theater and it absolutely won me over with its creative mix of the buddy cop genre with Disney animation. Like at its core, this is a buddy cop movie where there's an investigation, the odd couple pairing, that if it was an action comedy would feel a little bit stale, but because it's combined with cute animals, it's something fresh and different inside of the Disney canon, and it's also a movie that's very much about prejudice and not judging people by their exterior, and that combination makes it something special. Special. Certainly the messaging can get a little bit heavy-handed at certain points in time, but it's a good message, it's a clear message, and it fits the story that they're telling. There's also a bunch of laugh-out-loud sequences, in particular the one with the sloth at the DMV. We are in a really big hurry. I am on it break. But the glue holding it all together is that it's just jam-packed with a great set of characters that you enjoy, that you in want to spend more time with them on this adventure. And whether it's because it was the first movie that my kids saw in the theater or just because they loved it, they put this movie on all the time and absolutely love it. And it's a movie they watch on repeat that doesn't drive me crazy. 16, Big Hero 6. Now this is one of the least Disney feeling Disney animation films of all time. And in the case of this movie, that's not a bad thing at all. In true Disney fashion, they found a way to take a Marvel comic and adapt it into a story about finding friendship and family in an unusual place and telling a heartwarming story while having all the big action set pieces that you want from a Marvel comic adaptation. At its core, what makes it work is that you really believe in these characters and they came up with a great villain. Our lead two characters have a great bond and friendship between the two of them, Baymax in particular, is absolutely adorable, but then they give us a villain that has twists, turns, and reveals related to him, but they also give him a motivation that you can understand where he's coming from, so he's not just a mustache villain, twirling villain trying to do evil, there's something driving his actions, and it leads to a very heartfelt conclusion at the end of it. So this is one of these movies that Feels kind of strange that it is part of the Disney canon, but that doesn't at all mean it's not a really solid film. Then we have Mulan. In many ways, this is my type of story and adventure. It's a martial arts epic involving someone discovering their inner strength, stepping out to be a hero, taking a chance, all leading to a big climactic finale. That's my kind of movie. So naturally, this is a movie that's very easy for me to sit down and watch. Add to that, you've got a bunch of classic Disney songs, and especially during the Renaissance, they were just so good at telling great stories and including a bunch of catchy numbers into the mix. Now, this isn't a movie that I watched when it first came out because I was just I was in that phase where I wasn't watching a lot of animated movies when I was in high school. So I've more discovered this film over the last few years since I've had my own children that are starting to discover the Disney canon. Likewise, since the new Mulan came out, I've watched this movie multiple times since then and learned to appreciate it even more so. Coming in at number 14, Atlantis, The Lost Empire. Now this is a movie that I had never seen until just a couple years ago when I was ranking that era of Disney films. Check this one out and absolutely fell in love with it. It's kind of like a mix of Stargate, Avatar, and Indiana Jones, and I say all of that as a positive because it's just this great 
adventure story. The score is fantastic. There's a great mythology and world that you want to explore. Twist turns, all the stuff that make for a great blockbuster. Of course, over the last five years, Disney has been going wild crazy, adapting all of their older films that are animated into live action films. I feel like this is actually a prime candidate to do that, both because of the nature of the story, also because this was a movie that underperformed at the box office. And I think the technology is caught up to be able to turn this into a great PG-13 adventure film that would even make the story better. Number 13, Raya and the Last Dragon. Now this is a movie that when I very first saw the trailer I thought, that's a movie I'm probably really gonna like. And when I checked it out, I did. Then I asked my daughter about it and she said it was her favorite movie of all time. Hey Chloe, hey. what's your favorite movie? Raya and the Last Dragon. Woo! And I think this is just a great original story. They built out this mythology about all these kingdoms and the conflicts between them that you buy into the world. You want to learn more about what's going on. But beyond that, I think what pulls it together is that they have a hero with weaknesses and a villain that's sympathetic. You understand both of their motivations and why they're coming into conflict and what's driving them to make the choices that they're making that are escalating the conflict, but also w moving towards the resolution. The characters were great, the world was one that I wanted to explore, and the action itself was visceral and exciting. There's actually some videos about there about how they did the motion capture for it. Very cool, exciting stuff. All of it making for a great, great animated film. Next up, Sleeping Beauty, one of the most stunningly animated films of all time. It's truly incredible what they were able to accomplish over 60 years ago with this film. Features one of the great Disney villains of all time with Maleficent, and it's jam-packed with these classic, iconic Disney images, all leading up to this slam-bang finale with the prince battling a dragon and through a wall of thorns. All exciting, very cool stuff. And it might feel a little bit old fashioned to have a prince trying to save a princess, but at the same time, there's a reason that it's resonated with boys and girls for generations at this point in time. Now, at, at the same time, I feel like Aurora and the prince are a little bit generic, and if they were as captivating as Maleficent was, this movie probably would jump up into my top five. Number 11, Frozen, a spellbinding mix of irresistible characters, catchy songs, and truly laugh out loud moments. It propelled this film to becoming the highest grossing animated film of all time, and instantly, the songs and characters become icons of pop culture. They're memorable, they're quotable, and they're sing-alongable. I think I invented a word there. It's the kind of movie that gets the specifics so right that you forgive its many faults. Especially when it comes to the story and storytelling, it's a little bit clunky and uneven. Like there's seven songs in the first 35 minutes of the movie, and there's only two in the next hour, and all the great ones are in the first 35 minutes of the movie. Definitely has some pacing issues where it slows down in the middle. Some of the best characters aren't introduced until halfway through the movie. There's a lot of kind of repeated plot beats inside of it, but at the same time, None of that really matters all that much when you have so many characters that are absolutely adorable that you want to spend time with in so many fantastic songs. And in fact, one of the songs in here is my backup karaoke song. This is a perfect example of an imperfect story getting a huge boost from fantastic execution. Bringing us into the top 10, 101 Dalmatians. Now this movie was such a pleasant surprise on rewatch. I of course know the story, I've seen it many times before, but rewatching it, I was just captivated by how its storytelling is so simple, but effective. And that's what this movie does so well. There's no extraneous subplots. It's a simple story told in five parts so incredibly well. It's a movie that's not afraid to use silence. Like when at the beginning where they think one of the puppies has died, the movie goes silent. You can just imagine if they told this story again today, the music would be swelling, it'd be this big gigantic moment. 
This movie knows it's more effective to just go silent and sit in the emotion and the dread of sitting there with a dead newborn puppy in your hands. Therefore, when you realize it's not dead, it's so heartwarming and effective. Likewise, as you kind of move into the narrative, it does just a great job of using small, simple details to set up the important characteristics of the puppies and the different characters. Like one of the puppies is clearly established early on to like to watch TV, which later in the movie comes back around when they're trying to escape and he keeps wanting to watch TV. Simple setup payoff is what leads to the conflict rather than forced and contrived scenarios. It's also a movie that's like 40% a stealth movie, which is, I didn't realize that about the film, but it works as this escape film during the second half of it. So while it's one of these movies that isn't nearly as flashy as the modern Disney films, it's top-notch execution of what it's going for. There's faster-paced movies, there's ones with super-duper catchy songs and tons of jokes, but that doesn't make them more effective than a cute story about 101 Dalmatians. Number nine, Tarzan. This is another one that came out when I was in high school, so I never saw it until just a couple years ago and immediately thoroughly enjoyed it. Right off the bat, I love the animation style for this movie. The colors are bold and vibrant. The animation is so fluid as he's swinging through the trees and everything. What they were able to do here with modern technology plus hand-drawn 2D animation, this is a look that I absolutely love. From there, Tarzan and Jane are just a fun, adventurous couple that you buy into them, their relationship, and the adventures that they get swept up on. Likewise, I appreciate that they didn't get pretentious with the story. They stuck to the pulpy material, and they didn't try and lion-size the scope and size of the story. It's a fairly simple adventure where you have threat, danger, risk, urgency, all of that, but it's not trying to tell the biggest story of all time. Because of that, it's able to just sit as a solid, highly watchable adventure. Then we have Frozen 2. After six years in hibernation, Anna and Elsa return, and I think this one's just a little bit better than the original. Because all of the lead characters are already established at the beginning, it's able to tell a more focused story that balances the characters better, thus it's able to go deeper in with their relationships in a powerful and meaningful way. Also, I think it wisely just doubles down on the mythology of this world and everything that's been going on with Elsa and their family history. The world is bigger, the danger more palpable, and the magic more intriguing. And it leads to this great sequence where Elsa rides off to discover who she is and one of the most emotional little sequences in any Disney film, at least in the Chandler household. Now, I wish the movie had a better threat for the third act, and really that's my only gripe with this movie. Otherwise, I think it's just a great Disney fantasy film filled with great songs and characters I love to spend time with. Number seven, Tangled. Disney's return to the classic formula paid off. Sometimes you want fresh and subversive, and other times you need a classic formula executed with excellence, and that's what they did here. At its core, it's about a princess who's been held captive her entire life, and then you have an outlaw who's lived freely for himself his entire life, and the mix and the two of them together leads to a bunch of humor, action, and hijinks, and it's the perfect combination of characters. As always, the songs are catchy, fun, and get stuck in your head, but really for me, the thing that elevates this one is that as you move into the third act of the film and Rapunzel starts to discover who she is, her true lineage, and then that meeting with her and her parents, I think that is so emotionally powerful, and they don't even need to say a word when she meets her parents. Just the looks on their faces says everything that they need to do. So in this case, this is an example of where going back to the formula is exactly what they need, and they did a great job at it. That'll bring us to Cinderella, the classic story that everyone knows, but it's 
told with such elegance and in a memorable way, so all the little details pop out. The songs are catchy and memorable, the little side characters like the mice and the cat stand out, and everyone knows the plot beats because it's such a classic underdog story where you have Cinderella, someone that's very easy to root for, and her stepsisters and stepmother that are very easy to despise and not like at all. And it just creates a setup that leads to a wonderful payoff. In many ways, this is the definitive film version of this story that's been told many, many times before. Kicking off our top five, Wreck-It Ralph. Now this is a movie that feels more like Pixar should have put it out, but who cares? It's a great, great film. The central concept involves us learning about the personal lives of characters inside of computers, which many movies have tried to do over the last decade. Hello darkness, my old friend. But Wreck-It Ralph absolutely destroyed the competition in that regard. The central concept about an arcade where all of the characters live together and the villains have a support group, that's just witty and fun. Beyond that, it just feels like a really nicely constructed script jam-packed with fun sequences, but also themes about knowing and accepting who you are. And when you put it all together, it just makes for a movie that it feels like they really thought through every little sequence, every character, so that they pay off really nicely, all while being a ton of fun. And when Ralph thinks he needs to wreck a cart, the sequence will in fact wreck your heart. Hey, that rhymed. I'm a poet, and I didn't even know it. But the real magic here is that it's a movie with characters that you enjoy, and you enjoy spending time with, and there's a ton of great cameos all along the way. It's fun, it's funny, it's heartfelt, it's great. In fourth place, Peter Pan, a movie that from beginning to end is iconic, and memorable. At its core, it's this playful, dreamlike adventure involving pirates and Indians and children flying and swashbuckling, all kinds of fun stuff that children dream about, and it turns it into an adventure, all while tying in these themes about not wanting to grow up and the value of responsibility. It has a clear message, but it never feels the need to bonk you over the head with it. Just perfectly captures childlike imagination and playfulness. Real quick before I close out this epic ranking with my top three, remember to join me down below in the comments section. If you're up for the challenge, share your ranking of all 60 Disney animation films or as many as you've seen, share your ranking down below. My list isn't the right list, just my list and I would love to see yours. Also, I have done more of these epic rankings of animation franchises in studios. I've done DreamWorks, Pixar, and more. You can check those out right up here when this video is over. Kicking off our top three, Aladdin. Now this is easily one of the most fun films on this entire list, in large part because Robin Williams gives such a high energy, hilarious, and memorable performance as the genie. He is just a ball of charisma and joy in every single sequence that he's in. But even if Robin Williams wasn't the genie in this movie, it's still a rock solid adventure jam packed with great songs, chases, fights, magic, all the stuff that you want from a Disney film. Speaking of the songs, they're all great. Growing up, I actually had the soundtrack for this one on a tape and I had the version before they changed the lyrics to Arabian Nights. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. And this movie contains my go-to karaoke song. I can show you the world. A shining, shimmering, splendid. No one can tell us no. Now, I was the absolute perfect age to be the target audience for this film when it first came out. It was an absolute blast 30 years ago, and to this day, it's still an amazing experience. Our runner-up is Beauty and the Beast, the first animated film ever nominated for Best Picture, absolutely holds up 
30 years later. The entire film was created with this sense of elegance and gravitas that just elevates the entire film and makes it seem like they knew they were making something special as they created it. And that's not to say that it's devoid of the usual Disney humor. No, it's filled with quirky and fun side characters that add just enough humor all throughout the entire film, manages to perfectly balance sophistication with fun. The characters are great and the story at its core is about redemption and romance, so much so that you're able to buy into the Stockholm Syndrome romantic story at the core of the movie. At its core, it's not just a great Disney animation film and it's not just a great animated film, it's simply one of the great films of all time. But coming in at number one is The Lion King. Here, Disney goes full Shakespeare and the results are fantastic. From the opening shot to the closing credits, the entire film is just filled with these gorgeous shots that are massive in size. All the characters are interesting and bring something unique to the film. They're designed in a way where everyone has something memorable about them, where you're able to remember their personality, what they care about, and give them some moment where they stand out. And that's in particularly impressive because of how large the cast is for this film. Of course, the songs are fantastic, but the score from Hans Zimmer is equally memorable, iconic, and emotional. The movie's also just jam-packed with deep themes about responsibility, regret, growing up, dealing with our mistakes. So while it can entertain the youngest of children, its rich themes can pull out big emotions from any adult. Aside from one fart joke too many, this is basically a perfect film. Therefore, it comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video and want more like it, you can check out that playlist right over there with my ranking of the DreamWorks franchise, Pixar, Illumination, and more. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.